little webisode session and uh, we are currently discussing uh, various aspects of colon cancer and so far we have covered uh, the neoadjuvant and adjuvant the surgical part the basic anatomy and uh, the pathology part and we have reached now to discuss uh, potentially resectable colorectal cancer liver metastasis so we know that it's very interesting area where i mean uh, uh, the really uh, a protocol or a planning by the multidisciplinary team needs to be defined up front and the assessment and uh, the approach really matters how to tackle with it so we will we have uh, eminent faculty to discuss this uh, uh, very interesting topic we have dr vishal kumar shalach uh, he is a gi surgical oncologist from tantox shrine hospital singapore we have our dr nikhil agarwal who will be moderating the panel discussion after the talk and uh, we have dr shabir ali tu who is from kim kim's hospital trivandrum will be uh, the eminent faculty panelist we have dr partha sarthi uh, who is again from kim's hospital hyderabad and uh, sir will be joining us as a faculty panelist in the uh, case based panel discussion so dr varun goel is there who is medical oncologist from rajiv gandhi cancer institute will be joining in short while and we have dr animesh saha who is from apollo multi specialty hospital kolkata so eminent faculty from all over india so i hope that this discussion uh, gives us a meaningful conclusion to us so uh, with this i invite dr shala to start his talk thanks shefali i think um, uh, we have a lot of eminent people from all over india i hope i uh, i can cover certain aspects within 20 minutes bit difficult to cover everything but let's begin um, uh, good evening everyone um, uh, thanks for inviting me dr shefali dr nikhil um, today i'll be speaking on potential resectable colorectal liver mats uh, our treatment approaches or management approaches i have nothing to disclose uh, so this is just a basic outline i'll be talking a little bit of introductory talk on uh, the liver mat survey which shows some data about colorectal liver metastatic resection outcomes i'll talk a little bit little bit on clinical risk scoring systems touch a little bit on molecular uh, uh, scoring systems then we'll dive into synchronous and metachronous uh, uh, lesions where we'll talk a little bit on disappearing mats then we'll talk of various hepatic resection and strategies and we'll take some other peripheral considerations including a little bit on transplant extra hepatic resections talk a little bit on ablation and then give some simple take home messages um so as you know the colorectal uh, uh, liver mats is one of the common uh, mats from colorectal cancer about half of the patients will develop at some point in their journey uh, and as shefali already alluded you know the multi dcv teams are really uh, very essential integral to have a treatment plan and there is a significant data that mdt team actually can influence or change a, a recommendation uh, uh, from the index clinician Uh, which could actually impact survival outcomes i think liver surgery has traditionally been a little bit late development compared to other solid organs uh, it was previously formidable and now we know it is fairly safe uh, while we talk on colorectal liver mats i think is important to know that without surgery you know the outcomes are not so good so this uh, 25000 uh, plus patient data from europe already shows that 5 year survival is 42% and 10 year survival is 25 with liver resection and without resection you are not talking of any 10 year survivors and below 10% 5 year and the same uh, goes for non resection related uh, strategies uh, um, where surgery was done but for some reason liver was not resected again the five year survival would be almost half if resection is not done and that's the main reason today we are talking on resection for the liver cancer because it does improve survival outcomes for our patients now majority of the colon cancer patients will be under surveillance or follow up and at some point of time they will have elevated uh, carcino embryonic anti antigen um and that that would be one of the mechanism where liver metastasis would be suspected and then an imaging would be done to confirm that metastatic disease of course this is about metachronous um, 
when we do an imaging, I think we have various choices. Most of us would agree that ultrasound has limited utility except diagnosis because it doesn't help in treatment plans, uh, especially resection plans. Um, I think all three CT scan, MRI and PET scan have their own utilities. MRI is generally preferred in patients with previous chemotherapy exposure, uh, as well as in lesions which are below 10 mm in diameter, especially with the DWI and hepatobiliary specific contrast. Uh, it is fairly attractive. Uh, some units routinely do PET scan. Uh, our unit here do not routinely do PET scans, but uh, we do PET scans when CT scan raises suspicion of lung mats or some extra hepatic disease uh, where there's uncertainty and more info may be needed. Uh, one other reason we do PET scans would be a patient who is very high risk and we are finding reasons not to offer liver resection. Uh, then we find some other extra disease and then we could consider that patient for systemic uh, therapeutic options. There is some data to show PET scan can actually avoid unnecessary surgery, but this data to me is fairly old. And, and I think there is some other contrary data, data as well that it, it doesn't uh, uh, avoid surgery. It helps in the diagnostic abilities. Uh, the sensitivity of PET scan is actually low, uh, but it is very specific. So today's talk being on resectable, you know, there are various perspectives on what is resectable. To some surgeons, uh, what is resectable may be different to somebody else. Uh, so I think uh, the three terms here would be resectable, a borderline case, and unresectable. Uh, when you can leave behind sufficient liver uh, volume and you can remove the metastatic disease completely, uh, that's called clearly resectable disease. But when you can, uh, uh, be, you can leave behind sufficient volume, but there are some technical challenges like lesion is very close to major vessels or there are biological disease related issues like there are too many lesions uh, or there is some disease progression after chemo or there is potential extra hepatic. We would uh, lump them as borderline cases, though we can do the resection, uh, but they have some poor prognosticator. And unresectable would be, you know, very extensive liver involvement. Um, uh, and the burden of the disease is so much that you probably can't uh, have a safe patient if you actually embark on resection or you would end up getting an R2 resection, forget about R1. Um, so with that understanding, when we have a patient who is deemed suitable to, to be either resectable or borderline, then we assess for medical issues, uh, fitness of the patient and other issues, uh, oncologic issues, and then some technical considerations. So I'll go into these three medical, oncologic, and technical considerations. So I think medical issues, the first is whether the diagnosis is correct and whether you could actually offer some form of therapeutic treatment plan. Yeah. But there is a data. Now, we routinely don't do liver biopsies. We sometimes do liver biopsies because we have a significant population of hepatitis B and HCC is very common in Singapore. Uh, so sometimes, uh, and the lesion may be arterial enhancing. We are not clear about the washout. We actually end up doing a liver biopsy very occasionally when there is a liver, um, when the patient is HEP B positive carrier state. But routinely, liver biopsy is not necessary if uh, you know, colorectal meds are suspected because there is a significant data that needle tract seeding uh, can happen and it can affect uh, oncological outcomes. So that's done deal that we don't need to prove uh, by liver biopsy. When somebody had colon cancer um, and now there is a liver mat, in the treatment plan, it is very important to prognosticate um, what's the outcome going. And if the pro there are poor prognosticators, you may then want to uh, appropriately tailor your management by consideration of some form of systemic therapeutic options. So there are more than 10, 15 uh, clinical risk scores. And majority of them revolve around the number, the size of the lesions, uh, value of CEA, extra hepatic disease, differentiation, uh, biloba, node positive, and the disease-free interval. There are, on the right side, I put some of the uh, less uh, reported, but definitely reported uh, prognosticators as well. The next three slides is just a summary I've made of, of the existing uh, prognostic risk uh, scoring system. Um, it's just for awareness. I'm not going to read them. I'll just flash and give five seconds pause for each slide.
So as you can see, there are many scoring systems. The two more common uh, or more widely or the earlier ones uh, are Nordlinger and the Fong. And as you can see here, the scoring system gives us an idea about the survival outcomes, five-year survival uh, with regards to various uh, prognostic markers, including age, T4 disease, lymph node, size more than five centimeter, number of mats. Fong scoring system also gives uh, specific five markers which are you know, associated with poor outcomes. If your patient has any of these, you might want to consider systemic options prior to considering a liver resection. But again, that is uh, debatable and could be discussed at MDT meetings. Now, there is emerging data that this clinical risk scores are not as good as molecular biomarkers because we have identified a significant intratumoral heterogeneity as well as heterogeneity between different metastatic uh, sites. Uh, so recently there is an, um, 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 you know, the, the gene molecular risk score has been validated and it has been proposed to be more a better prognosticator than the clinical risk scores, uh, including some uh, KRAS and BRAF mu mutations also being considered in therapeutic planning. So when we have done the oncologic and medical considerations, then if liver resection is being planned, then comes the technical issues where there are mainly two. Uh, if you are talking of synchronous metachronous or we are talking of a future liver remnant, as you all know that most important is not what is taken out of the body, but what stays in the body. Routinely in Singapore, we will do volumetry if we are planning major resections and we routinely do ICG dye test. Um, Sometimes ICG dye test may not be accurate if the patient has gotten a uh, chemotherapy before uh, uh, the liver surgery, and we would then discount that. Uh, we would then put a more weightage and volumetry and the type of the resection, what we do. We generally don't do scintigraphy for future liver remnant assessment. When we talk of synchronous or metachronous, there are many definitions, including some authors even considering six months after the colon surgery, they consider as a synchronous disease. I find this uh, ego slim consensus group definition fairly good for the surgical trainees to, um, uh, to be familiar with. Um, so if something is done um, at or before the diagnosis of primary tumor, if you detect the liver mat, then it's synchronous. If it's within 12 months, it's early metachronous and detected after 12 months, uh, then is late metachronous. Um, so if you have synchronous liver mats, then you have a problem of, of uh, menu. You have three things to decide, whether to do colon first, whether to do synchronous colon and liver, or whether to do the reverse approach. Uh, some people believe that synchronous uh, prognosis is a little bit worse compared to metachronous. So the sequencing is important. In general, there is no brainer that if, because it's colon primary, if there is bleeding, if it's symptomatic, probably colon should come out first. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it is fairly straightforward. Uh, but again, MDT teams are essential then to decide if a patient should get a liver first or patient should get a synchronous liver resection. Uh, locally, we will do synchronous if... Uh, surgeons, the hepatobiliary surgeons are fairly confident that it is not going to be a difficult resection. We may not need to do Pringle maneuver. We may not have excessive blood loss. Patients are relatively fit uh, with the, the good performance status. Uh, we probably are aggressive. Uh, we actually do uh, a fair bit of synchronous liver resections. In fact, we have even done major liver resections like right hepatectomy um, synchronous. I personally wouldn't do a trisection at Tommy synchronous with the colon uh, with the colon resection. Majority of the available data doesn't include uh, major liver resections. Majority of the synchronous data in the literature is all about minor liver surgery. I think liver first approach is attractive. Uh, to me, it is mainly attractive in patients with uh, rectal primary because they need new adjuvant chemo radiation. Um, and after um, after new adjuvant chemo radiation, and then you could actually consider uh, some form of uh, liver resection, and later they could do rectal, or you could actually do synchronous uh, after the new adjuvant. But liver first approach uh, is uh, not very widely done. I have done, probably done one only in my in my own uh, experience, uh, but it is also a, a choice. Uh, there are various. Uh, 
uh, publications being compared in a meta-analysis about synchronous liver first and all that and oncological outcomes are almost similar. What happens in metachronous liver lesions? Now, metachronous, we have again a lot of choices whether to give chemotherapy first and then operate uh, or to operate straight away. And if operate, what kind of surgery to be done? So if it's clearly resectable, then you want to just operate or you want to give chemo, new adjuvant chemo and then do surgery. I think the data uh, comes from the EORTC trial. Um, there is no difference in overall survival at 8.5 year follow-up. And if you give chemotherapy first, well, the progression-free survival is better, but the perioperative morbidity also increases. So all the theoretical potential benefits of new adjuvant are not really translated at least on data, in the overall survival benefit. Uh, there are some ongoing studies. And what happens because of chemotherapy, uh, if the chemo interval and surgery interval is below one month or there are more than nine cycles given, then actually a liver operation-related morbidity, including bile leak, intra operative blood loss, which could affect outcomes as well. So in general, if it is clearly resectable, at least in our local MDTs, we prefer to go upfront resection. But there are some patients we would actually then consider for new adjuvant chemotherapy as well. Uh, I think this slide is just an extension of, uh, of uh, what I'm uh, proposing. Uh, in general, we would consider some factors. If the adverse prognostic factor, a patient could be considered for new adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, by and large, if it is easily resectable disease, then we favor upfront surgery. To me, the main problem of new adjuvant chemotherapy in upfront resectable patients is disappearing liver metastasis. And this is an oncologist's dream, but it becomes difficult for a surgeon. Um, there is data to show that even if there, there is disappearing lesion, about 80% will have a microscopic residual disease on histology. Um, and complete pathological response uh, is not really there. But if there is a pathological response, it is actually good prognosis for the patient. Majority of the data, existing data says that if there is disappearing liver metastasis, if you leave it alone, there is a risk of local recurrence and thereby you don't leave it alone, you operate. But with the disappearing liver mats, you probably need to have a good quality preoperative imaging, either MR or uh, CT scan of good quality. Uh, and then you need intraoperative ultrasound skills. There are various uh, three-dimensional navigation uh, technologies and early reports coming in last five years. Um, and if you can't even detect, then you just go for territorial resection. That means you review the preoperative, the pre-chemo scans and base your liver resection judgment um, um, accordingly. MDT sometimes may decide to, uh, to leave the disappearing liver mats patient alone and just monitor. Um, there, is, there are many reports which shows up to 18 to 80 percent viable tumor in disappearing liver mats and thereby resection is needed. And sometimes all this technology and imaging tools can actually help you um, to uh, perform a safe surgery. When we do liver resection, some considerations are anatomical resections and non-anatomical resections. In general, the uh, overall survival and perioperative morbidity is not much different. So my majority of the people would prefer a parenchyma preserving hepatic resection. So you can preserve more liver. In future, if there is a recurrence, you can still uh, operate compared to non-parenchyma preserving. Um, Laparoscopic and robotic liver resections are coming up. Locally, we don't do robotic liver surgery. We are doing robotic pancreas a little bit more than robotic liver. Laparoscopic liver is uh, two-thirds of our work is probably laparoscopic liver. Um, but difficult liver resections like close to the cava, segment seven, very posterior, averting the cava, uh, we are still doing open. Uh, importantly, I was in Southampton when orange trial was ongoing and uh, Prof Primrose uh, and all were trying very hard to recruit the patient and, and you know, trial actually was prematurely closed because they failed to recruit enough patients to compare lab and open. And majority of the lab uh, reported patients are actually the minor liver resections and not a major liver resections. So in essence, when you talk of surgery, we have some choices like parenchyma preserving liver resection uh, upfront if it is possible. If the future liver remnant is not good enough, you may have to consider portal vein embolization. 
If still that is not good, patient has bilobar extensive disease, we may consider two-stage liver resections or an ALPS and very rarely uh, consider liver transplantation. Very briefly, I will talk on that. I think portal vein embo is a very established process. Most of us are familiar with it. It augments the future liver remnant, reduce the risk of post hepatectomy liver failure. The small problem of PV is the disease will progress while you're waiting for liver to hypertrophy. We are waiting for scheduling of the portal vein embo by your radio team and all that. Generally, try to minimize the time duration to below one month. Uh, there is sufficient data to show that portal vein embo did not affect the overall survival or intrahepatic recurrence. And majority of the time, there is a good hypertrophy with portal vein embolization. Um, but that is, that is with vigilance. If you are not uh, vigilant, uh, then you patients sometimes can have delay and disease may progress. If there is bilobar extensive disease, tumor burden is very high. Uh, you may want to consider two-stage liver resections, that is uh, two different operations sequentially. The aim is, of course, to give an R0 resection to the patient and remove all the disease. Generally, this is combined with portal vein embolization to achieve some form of liver regeneration and hypertrophy. There is good data to show that 75% of your patients can have both the stages. About 25% of patients will progress after first stage. Uh, before the patient goes on for the second stage, there will be progression of disease uh, and, and the patient will never go on to the second stage. And two-stage liver resections has a significant morbidity and 20 and 40% after the first and the second stage. But it gives a decent overall survival in people with high tumor burden. It's not bad. Median survival of about 37 months, three years uh, in high tumor is actually quite good. Uh, we have been doing ALPS, uh, about 15, 17 ALPS have been done. Um, that gives a rapid accelerated hypertrophy compared to the portal vein embolization. And actually, completion rate may be better than two-stage um, hepatectomy. Um, ALPS can also be used if PV fails to achieve the hypertrophy. The problem with ALPS is a significant morbidity and significant mortality. Uh, you know, the data shows that ALPS can have morbidity about, uh, about 20% and mortality of about 10%. So you need to select your patients well. You can't have uh, more than 70-year-old and elderly patient with poor performer. Uh, otherwise, invariably, there'll be problems. Uh, increasingly, now we, are, we have done about 30, 40 repeat liver resections. Typically, this is mainly for HCC. But I think colorectal liver metastasis, if it recurs in the liver, uh, we can consider lipid liver resections. And that's one of the reasons parenchyma preserving liver resection e is important. If your first liver surgery is done laparoscopic, your second liver surgery could be done laparoscopic as well, and it becomes a little bit easier. Uh, personally, I feel uh, uh, the hypertrophy of the liver sometimes can pose a technical challenge with the rotation and distortion of the anatomy. Plus, if you have done previous higher dissection, uh, then it could be a little bit more challenging. Increasingly, people are doing liver transplant in METS. Um, I think the data come from the CICA study, and now they are doing CICA-3 study. The results are still awaited. Some people consider it experimental. Majority people still consider experimental, but liver transplant units are pushing. There are certain poor prognosticators identified from CICA-1. Uh, so, uh, the upcoming studies would consider those more than 5.5 CA, high CE levels and progression despite chemo as kind of a soft contraindications for transplant. Uh, but I think the, the data is awaited. I think Timothy Pollock from USA has a very nice data to show the margins. We know that previously we advocated one centimeter margin. Then, of course, more than one centimeter then came as one centimeter is good enough. Then came as even 5 to 5 mm is good enough and then came anything is good enough. So right now we are in the era of anything is good enough as far as is clear. And that data come from this annals paper where, you know, it is shown that as far as you have got, R, you know, margin, R0 margin is good enough. And most people say R1 margin is still better than not doing um, the surgery at all. Uh, and most of this comes because we know that recurrences are outside the resection margins and margin is considered now a surrogate of tumor biology uh, rather than uh, in, in C2 itself being a prognosticator. But that doesn't give a surgeon a leeway to do anyhow any surgery. He should still aim for uh, as wide margins as uh, technically possible and, and feasible and safe. 
increasingly we see people with extra hepatic disease typically lung metastasis um, it could be in the peritoneum or paraortic on portal node but the lung synchronous liver and lung also is possible when you have a lung metastasis you could actually treat the lung as well you could ablate rfa for the lung the liver met survey shows that liver plus lung metastatectomy is actually as good as liver metastatectomy in terms of oncological outcomes the problem is majority of the patients the disease will recur um, if it is extra hepatic disease again the lung outcomes are better but paraortic portal nodes and peritoneal outcomes are not as good as lung the data shows 30 to 60 percentage five year survival if you have done a liver and lung resection again these are all selected studies retrospective data um I've done only few patients with hyalur lymph node. I, I particularly feel colorectal match to the portal lymph node enlargement is a, a quite fairly poor prognosticator. Um, later, I'm happy to share, um, I'm happy to hear from the rest of the panelists. Uh, but that doesn't stop us from operating in a patient with good performance status. And if you can take out the lymph node entirely, especially the PET scan doesn't show any other disease elsewhere and you could take render patient disease free and um, then we would do a portal lymphadenectomy as well i think this paper man, gives a good summary of all the high lymph node in, in colorectal cancer patients liver surgery we have been increasingly doing uh, uh, prehabilitation we are beyond the enhanced recovery principle so some elderly people we will actually put them in the inpatient prehabilitation um, you know physiotherapy dietitian uh, nutrition kind of uh, inpatient environment supervised monitored tracked for about 2 to 3 weeks and then operate there is emerging data that if you can operate, uh, operate, but if patient has high co high comorbidity profile, you may just want to ablate. And ablation outcomes are not bad. Actually, they are quite equal, almost equivalent to resection outcomes. Um, one of the randomized control trial was prematurely stopped because of, uh, because of various various reasons, including the clinician bias with regards to the ablation. I think there are some ongoing data uh, trials on ablation. Microwave ablation is a little bit more attractive because uh, you could uh, reduce the heat sink effect and it could be used near the biliary tree. Um, there are data that microwave ablation um, compared to surgery uh, is uh, also equivalent. What to do after resection? Once you have resected, would you then give chemotherapy or would you just wash? I, I think the aim is to reduce the recurrence and improve the survival with the least amount of side effects or toxicity. But most of the trials actually have shown, failed to show the benefit of improved survival. Uh, many of our patients will just put them on surveillance, especially the elderly ones. Um, I think there are various emerging, uh, you know, with biologics, molecular targeted agents and hepatic arterial infusion chemotherapy, you could actually uh, debate the, which option is the best. I'm coming towards the end. I didn't cover the TACE and the Y90 part, which we also do very liberally in uh, liver metastatic, focus more on surgical aspect. I think the take home messages would be, accept that there are uncertainties, there is no one size fit for all, um, and uh, uh, share the decisions with your patient, give them uh, probably the choices so they could participate. Whenever possible, get an MDT consensus. There is no defensive challenge without an MDT. A unilateral decision by a surgeon is almost biased until proven otherwise. Uh, whenever possible, refer your patients to clinical trials. This is the best way to get the evidence. Perioperative chemo with Folfox has no detrimental effects on mortality and it improves the disease-free survival, uh, but it doesn't actually help in uh, overall survival, uh, but could be considered. Um, the issue will be dis, uh, disappearing liver metastasis. And most of the guidelines give the option to offer adjuvant or perioperative chemo in resectable colorectal meds. So one should realize how difficult it is to include your patients in a clinical trials with a control arm con containing surgery alone. And again, uh, MDT consensus is very, very important. And lastly, just to say that not everything is evidence-based because by the time research is done, published and disseminated, it takes almost about 15, 17 years. So sometimes you do have to push the limit. You do have to engage your patient and family and your colleagues while you do something which is not considered a standard of care. Thank you for attention and, and happy to be involved in discussion. Thanks. 
thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shalat. Wonderful uh, summarize, wonderful elaboration of uh, the approach to colorectal liver metastasis. I think uh, there are a couple of questions there in chat box. So one question is there if both surgery and RFA we'll are take that, for uh, liver... Ali, in the uh, Achha, You will discuss session. in the panel. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Sure. So, so Mr. You Shalat is already... Yeah. Uh, haven't left much for me to discuss. And if you take that question, I will have nothing left. So <laughs> I'll leave it for panel discussion. So Dr. Salat, I mean, uh, thank you very much. It was a very, very uh, uh, well presented thing. You've summarized almost everything and that makes my job very difficult. I mean, uh, you have discussed most of the things which I was going to discuss uh, in the panel discussion. So I'll just bring out the nuances because there are uh, like, uh, more sides to everything. Like I think we have some medical oncologists on panel and uh, they will have a lot of points about this new adjuvant and adjuvant and perioperative chemotherapy and especially the role of biologicals, which they are always excited about. So uh, we'll hear their views also. And uh, so with this- uh, Dr. Uh, Nikhil, I think uh, Varun probably has not joined yet, probably stuck up in the opening. Anyway, I'll try to Shifali. pitch in. Yeah, yeah, I try to pick in wherever you wish. And, to. and uh, just call up Dr. Batra also if he's free. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll so call up. Us... Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm sweating the panel discussion and. Uh... So can we uh, see our slides? Is it visible the slides? Yeah, yeah. fine. And uh, I guess everybody's there. Dr. Animesh is there, right? Yes. Yeah, good, thank you. So uh, we we'll start with the panel discussion and uh, the stage has already been set by Dr. Shalat and he has almost told everything which is important in the colorectal liver metastasis management. And it's a very, very interesting topic, uh, not uh, interesting from the point of view of management. It's very, very interesting from the point of view of decision making, because there are several approaches. Uh, you can do liver first, you can do chemo first and then liver, you can do synchronous, I mean, simultaneous resection, you can stage them out. Uh, you can give new adjuvant, you can give new adjuvant with biologicals. So you can do anatomical resection, you can do a wedge resection, you can combine RFA microwave with resection, you can do two stage resection. I mean, it's, it's something which uh, still, I mean, case to case requires so much of thought process, so much review of imaging that I, I just love this topic very much. So, I mean, with this overview, let's start. And uh, uh, Dr. Shifali has already uh, introduced our eminent panelist. Uh, fortunately, the moderator was not eminent. So, at least we have somebody uh, who, who can be more to the ground. And uh, Dr. Shailath has already told us about the rationale of resection. So, I'm not asking that question because obviously that's the only hope for long term uh, survival and cure. Now I'll start with the case. Uh, so it was a 46 year old gentleman who presented somewhere in uh, 2017 uh, with like features of colon uh, cancer evaluated, found to have a CA sigmoid colon and uh, solitary liver uh, lesion, segment eight, right? So uh, so don't look at these slides. I mean, it's from a presentation. So I have some uh, answers which are written there. So uh, Dr. Partha, uh, yeah. How are you going to uh, work up these patients? So, so we assume that the slide is not there. Yeah, you assume that the slide is there. I mean, there are so many more. We stop at coloscopy and that shows a growth at 30 centimeters. And uh, CT has shown a lesion in segment eight. Uh, is that's, it all we have? It. Yeah, that's the information we have. So it's adenocarcinoma, it's colon cancer with uh, liver metastasis. And we have one CT scan. So what further evaluation you will do? How you you work up this patient for further management? Okay, now, uh, uh, first thing I will want to know the load of extrahepatic disease. So if there is any extrahepatic disease in him. So I would- so Not in this scan. Uh, not in the CT scan. Not have. in the CT scan, yes. So CT scan is only uh, the abdomen. So uh, I would want to get a, a PET CT in this patient. Because for me, potentially upfront, uh, based on the CT, this looks like a lesion where I can do a simultaneous colonic and uh, resection of the colorectal met. So if I'm going to tackle both, I need to be really sure that I'm not leaving behind any extrahepatic uh, disease. And uh, if there is no EHD, then this, is a, uh, this has got a very uh, 
this is expected to have a very good outcome following a simultaneous resection because it's going to be a sigmoid colon resection with probably a non anatomical resection of the segmentate le lesion if if it is feasible and that will be a very low morbid resection so if i am very sure there is no ehd uh, i would uh, uh, go ahead with this plan right uh, so i mean uh, yes as dr shalat said that uh, shalat you don't do routinely pet ct right we don't routinely do pet ct uh, partly because the ct scan and mri liver are good enough unless the ct scan and mri show some uh, issues like uh, small lung lesion um which is not able to be characterized some lymph node enlargement which we are concerned is this a uh, metastatic then we interrogate that with pet uh, so i mean yes both approaches are fine i mean the literature says that uh, uh, like around 8 to 10% patients have their disease uh, strategy changed by doing a pet ct but routinely we also do pet ct uh, dr shepali would agree and uh, dr shalat said uh, that biopsy confirmation is not required so i'm not asking that question so uh, regarding mri so will you do routinely mri in all patients uh, dr shabir ali shabir yes Uh, we we are yeah, not able sorry, to do sorry. Uh, yeah sorry sorry he was mute so in the uh, in this situation there is no confusion that we will also go for a pet scan and uh, i would uh, like to know the ca as well in this situation if the ca is within 100 and all uh, i would go for a pet scan and then as uh, partha said i would also agree for a if it is a peripheral lesion for a simultaneous resection but if ca is too high or if the liver is showing any other suspicious lesion then in that situation i would consider an mri to look for any multi multiple disease or multiple lesions in the liver no which is not picked up on ct otherwise oh, you do uh, mri routinely or only no no, no no not routine we do a pet scan uh, mri only if you have an uh, uh, like disproportionate ca in this situation no or if i have some suspicion on ct like a nash liver where you want uh, you have some suspicion of more lesions in the liver to clarify i would i may go for an mr in this situation right. otherwise so, so, i would go for pet only great so we'll look at the tumor markers we'll do a imaging and we might add a pet ct and we'll proceed with a uh, surgery so so what are the things which we will be uh, looking at pre operative scan like so obviously this looks like an easy case there is a segment 8 sink solid lesion which appears to be on the surface but uh, sometimes we'll have more metastasis sometimes we'll have a bulky disease so what are the goals of pre operative imaging dr patha uh, when i do a pre operative imaging in such a case um, i would want to study the image in two categories one is from the oncological point of view and second is from the liver resection point of view so from the oncological point of view it will be about uh, the location of the primary the uh, t stage of the primary local organ invasion lymph nodal status and the number and the distribution of the liver mats so that will give an idea about the uh, uh, oncological part of it second in such a case where i would also uh, plan a simultaneous liver resection or in any case where i want to uh, plan a liver resection our focus also will be on the uh, nature of the liver parenchyma if it is fatty or if it is um, a normal liver if the patient has received a pre operative chemotherapy for uh, in especially a metachronous uh, lesion setting i would look for uh, cash or any steatosis i would want to have an uh, idea as to after what will be the future liver remnant um and if there is a fatty liver like uh, shabir mentioned i would want to reconsider doing an additional mode of investigation to make out uh, if there are any hidden metastases especially in a fatty liver um apart from that um uh, it basically for surgical planning for a, a liver resection so these are the points we we will see in uh, uh, imaging So, Nikhil, can I have something? Really... Yeah, please, please. I think we are discussing about a colon primary with liver mass, but yeah, sure. Obviously, uh, the topic is about colorectal primary. So, if we are dealing something with a rectal primary with solitary liver mass, in that case, we might need a MRI pelvis as well before proceeding with the treatment because we might find out some high risk factors 
in the primary as well, like the uh, modal vascular invasion, limb modal involvement, TRM threatened or not, that might uh, uh, hint us whether we need a preoperative radiotherapy or the surgeon need to uh, how the surgeon will approach the primary as well. Yes, absolutely, Doctor Anime. So, so we'll be discussing actually rectal uh, later. So uh, yes, you are absolutely right there. So we've done that. So after that, like once we have done that, we would want to put these patients into some buckets. So how broadly would you classify them, Dr. Shalat, from the point of view of management? I mean, I've just put three broad categories, but you can uh, el uh, elaborate a bit more. In, in my talk also, I actually put up the same three categories. I, I think generally we would put them as um, operable or surgery first or chemo first kind of a, a, men, a mental model. Um, if it is resectable, we would probably want to um, discuss with the patient and convince our oncology colleagues that we probably are better off resecting this. Uh, so based on the imaging, I think um, if there is no obvious extra hepatic disease, we, uh, you know, if, if the surgically we can achieve R0 resection, we would, we would just say is a clearly resectable disease. If surgically R0 resection is a bit difficult, uh, a patient has multiple uh, biloba disease, high tumor burden, but you can still do it, then you put as borderline. Um, and, and if there's clear extra hepatic disease, uh, lymph node, uh, probable lymph node enlargement, which is kind of proven on 18 FDG, EBIT uh, nodule, uh, then we would con consider them as potentially convertible uh, uh, you know, uh, status. Yeah, that's probably uh, my feeling. Bukshabir, anything to add there? No, no, it's, uh, I think it's almost same only for us. Uh, we will categorize in the MDT meeting all these patients with uh, uh, synchronous liver meds to either a potentially curable or a non-curable. Upfront, we will make an idea. And then uh, where we stand. Because after some time, you may get a... Once. Uh, after some time, you may get confusion on this. So we usually make an upfront, like you have a multiple bilobar disease and multiple lung lesion as well. Those patients, now we upfront keep, that's a clear cut situation where you keep them as uh, incurable disease and probably in a palliative intent treatment. All other patients where you can, con you can con uh, either they are upfront uh, easily treatable or potentially convertible, we will keep it as a curative intent treatment. And then we'll go about it. So the only uh, thing here, uh, which I or most of us know, is that see, as of now, there's no clear-cut definition. Like we have these definitions for pancreatic cancer. We know which is resectable, which is borderline resectable. Here we don't have definitions. So, so somebody is clearly resectable. Maybe somebody is borderline resectable. Uh, so, so there is a lot of gray, and this is like surgeon dependent. So uh, that, that is something which we have to keep in mind. Apart from that, yes, we have to put these patients into these three buckets. So do you consider molecular markers in the decision-making process? Nakshalat, do you? Yes, uh, I think um, if uh, somebody is not upfront clearly resectable, um, then all these markers are being asked by our you know, oncology colleagues because they need to make a judgment with regards to the, the chemo regimens they are giving and a patient discussion about the efficacy of the, of the treatment they are giving with the patient. So routinely, the, our hospital would then ask for extended histological analysis on the index uh, colorectal specimen if it is a metachronous uh, scenario um, uh, on all these markers. And then based on that, these markers mainly are for prognostication and for guiding the patient with regards to the, you know, the effectiveness of the treatment. Um, it doesn't really affect uh, upfront surgical, clearly resectable uh, patient uh, management, actually. Yeah. And, and does it impact your borderline or potentially convertible patients in terms of planning? Or, or you, so, you, so basically, I would clarify the question more. Will the plan be same with or without this for you, or will it differ? It will differ. Uh, but uh, again, if it is clearly resectable, then the plan will be the same. It just comes out, regardless of all these markers. Uh, and then patient will be considered for adjuvant chemotherapy, rather than just adjuvant uh, monitoring or surveillance. I mean, adjuvant therapy. 
rather than just uh, uh, surveillance because it's a pro prognosticator they are better off receiving some form of systemic treatment after surgical resection. So plan will be a little bit different, but if it is resectable, uh, they wouldn't change the resection, um, upfront resection strategy. Oh, Dr. Animesh, do you have a, a point, anything to add here? Yeah, so uh, I would agree with uh, Dr. Shilat. If it is resectable, our treatment plan shouldn't be changed based on this molecular marker. Uh, if it is borderline resectable or potentially resectable, whatever you say, it's better to have this molecular marker done. But uh, having said that, the data, uh, all the data that we have in uh, colorectal oligometastatic disease, where the patient has been treated with a curative intent, there's no evidence that adding biological improves overall survival. So, if we are treating with a radical intent with the oligometastatic disease, we usually do not add biological. If it is undesectable, mm -hmm. it is undesectable and we are not sure it's going to be ever resectable and we are treating with the, the patient with a palliative intent. Then all this molecular marker should be done and based on this marker, the, the biological therapy of bevacitumab or cetuximab should be added depending on the, the molecular marker, left side is or right side is missing. Dr. Shafali, do you want to say something? Yeah, so just uh, one more. Now it is a PANRAS rather than KERAS. It's KERAS and NRAS both. So what we need to do, uh, basically the role comes in uh, potentially convertible or unresectable. So in uh, clearly resectable, it does not actually hamper the decision making for surgery at the first place. Uh, so risk scores, yes, we do calculate, but it again doesn't have uh, uh, bearing on the immediate next step. And uh, so, so these, this is just a slide which I made for students to understand. So we have to uh, categorize these patients into say uh, synchronous, metachronous, resectable, potentially resectable, bilobar, unilobar. Biology has very important. So good biology, bad biology, which will be determined by like clinical risk score molecular markers, size, presentation. And now there is uh, like a lot of distinction between made between both right, left and rectal primary. So there are nuances there as well. So these are the things which we should keep in mind when categorizing these patients into uh, what to do. I mean, as of now, there aren't much categories, but the data is evolving. And we'll have sooner some more approaches based on uh, these things. Now comes a very, very contentious topic, which is about the perioperative uh, treatment. Now we uh, all know that there are two randomized controlled trial uh, with current, like with the newer regimens of Polpox. And uh, uh, there are three, four more trials with single agent chemo. And there is one trial with cetuximab, uh, new epoch. So none of these trials actually showed a uh, survival advantage. Uh, initially, they did so PFS advantage, and then they didn't show survival advantage in the uh, long-term analysis. Uh, obviously, uh, the patients which were included in this trial were all clearly resectable. None of them had uh, uh, unresectable or uh, uh, potentially resectable disease. And uh, <clears throat> those still, most of the centers and most of the guidelines uh, do recommend some form of adjuvant or perioperative chemotherapy. So, Dr. Shefali, what's your uh, take on this? Yeah, so like we discussed, we categorize the patient into clearly resectable, potentially convertible, and unresectable. So, we are clear about potentially resectable, we go for surgery upfront. Now, if we see the data for adjuvant chemo, of course, one trial which was EORTC initially showed a DFS advantage. However, it does not, did not translate into OS advantage, but we should remember that it was not powered enough to calculate that OS advantage. So initial primary endpoint was DFS. Now there is one Japanese trial which tried to answer this question. This also initially showed there is a DFS advantage, but however, OS was not beneficial. So it's really a gray zone. So I think the choice of patient would matter. So it's not only the liver metastasis, it's the primary tumor burden also. If you see there is a heavy nodal burden disease, there are high risk factors. 
I mean, LVI present, poorly differentiated morphology. I think that gray zone benefit can be discussed in tumor board whether adjuvant therapy needs to be offered to such kind of patient. There is no clear yes or no for these. Now, if we see the potentially resectable group, now potentially convertible, the whole soul idea is to make the tumor to a resectable situation. So in that situation, we have three options which are actually available. One is uh, for Fox or Folfiri alone, uh, plus minus biologicals. We'll discuss about the biological rule. And one is for Foxiri, obviously. Now, how to choose or make a decision out of it? So young people, poor prognostic disease like right-sided colon, heavy nodal burden, systemic threat. I think people can tolerate for Foxiri well, so that would be the choice. Or if somebody is BRAF mutated, KRAS mutated, for Foxiri is the way to go. And otherwise, I think uh, there is no clear cut again differentiation point between Folfox versus Folfoxiri or Folfiri. Now, having said that, any role of biologicals. So, I would summarize uh, biologicals in a way. So, anti EGFR therapy, I think there is no data to suggest that adds on advantage in a perioperative neoadjuvant setting. However, in a heavy burden disease where the conversion is really a concern, so add on bevacizumab, there is some data that potential conversion does improve. So that would be my take on that. Mish, you would want to add something here? Yeah, I think I would agree with the Bali. Uh, that is the way we go. Uh, I would say that perioperative approach where we are treating the patient with PLD building, we try to avoid biological, but when there is large volume disease, whether in the primary or the liver med, there are concerns that it might not be resectable. It's better to start with the uh, chemo plus biological therapy. Next, Shalat, I mean, uh, what's your experience with these uh, patients when they get biologicals and then you operate them? Do you uh, like see any increased morbidity or you're okay with that? Well, the, uh, most of these patients will, the liver will be very soft. Uh, there will be uh, extra blood loss compared to the normal, but there is no normal, you know, either you're operating for cirrhotic patients for HCC or you're operating for these kind of patients. So liver will be soft, uh, mobilization, handling. If you are delegating this to a trainee to do the things, you know, you have to be a little bit cautious. Uh, but I think with QSA, with uh, the good technology, I think uh, with surgical adjuncts and all that for hemostatic, uh, probably it is still safe. But you're right, the liver will be soft. You, there will be some incremental expected blood loss compared to your normal uh, upfront uh, resection patients. Um, and you need to talk to your oncologist because you need to time the surgery. The timing is important and you need to communicate when is the last uh, cycle given. And based on that, you need to align to your patient uh, uh, you know, surgical listing date. Uh, and after surgery you as well, you need to engage the oncology with regards to follow up. Um, so ideally, before they discharge, the oncologists will come and see them and give their, their follow-up along with our perioperative follow-up. And sometimes I feel patients get confused to see so many doctors and every doctor will do blood tests and scan. So again, there should be one reference point. And I delegate that reference point to my medical oncology. So I wouldn't do a random CT scan. I wouldn't do a random tumor marker. I'll let my oncology the team to lead it and I'll just give surgical flavor in the in the, op, in the perioperative follow period over to you Nikhil and, and and which are the patients you would want biologicals to be added uh, like what kind of tumor burden you would want the biologicals to be added in preoperative setting I I think um, it, it, it is mostly guided by my oncology colleagues and oncology team. So usually in the MDT, when the discussions of adding biologic versus not adding, it would be led by oncology oncology team. And there are certain other factors, including the financial uh, implications of adding oncology, uh, as well as the performance status of the patient, whether the patient is able to tolerate them. Nikhil, I think in Singapore, at least in my hospital, our average patient profile is 75 to 85 year old. So uh, uh, the performance status, the comorbidity profile is not suitable to, to give uh, a very intense uh, chemo plus biology. So generally, I'll remain I, I guided agree. by the family and oncology discussions. So, so, you know, one of the questions which is often asked in these MDTs is... Uh, 
by again our oncology colleagues, medical oncology colleagues, how much downstaging you want. So, so I think that is a very, very pertinent question here uh, because that decides whether we are giving Paul Fox or Paul Fix three or uh, adding a biological. So I think we can grade it that way that it is just, you know, a tumor averting a vein where we want some downstaging or we just want, <clears throat> we, we expect this to be a poor biology, probably a Paul Fox will do. We want a little more downstaging. We can add a Paul Fox array. And if we want, Significant downstage. This is in a patient which we want from unresectable to convergent to resectable. Then probably we should add biological. What do you think, Dr. Sabir, on this? Yeah, this situation I have a bit uh, different opinion. Like uh, the resectability improvement, you know, in my personal opinion, it's uh, it can be better done by adjuncts like portal vein embolization or something like that, rather than giving more chemo. So if we have a vein like a middle hepatic vein, which is close, you have to think about taking out the middle vein by improving the left lobe, maybe a left lateral lobe volume by doing a portal vein embolization. So basically in a borderline resectable, what I would uh, feel is you give some maximum three months like that. Uh, that will give you an uh, idea about the biology as well. And then think about other adjuncts rather than continuing with chemo and damaging that liver, which will uh, avoid a resection, which which may uh, in prohibit a rese resection later on. Arthur, you agree with this? I think I, I will uh, agree with Shabir uh, on, on this. See, one more thing: the the uh, the extent of your resection is is decided uh, the day you see the uh, CT scan. I don't think you will modify the amount of liver you would resect. Uh, after the chemo, because there is no way of telling uh, how much of actual response uh, has happened after chemotherapy. So your resection planning is done at diagnosis. So all you're trying to achieve is to improve your FLR to achieve that resection. So if you are, uh, even by your resist criteria, if you see that there is excellent response after chemo, there is no way of telling that you are going to limit your resection to a smaller uh, parenchymal segment than what was initially there. Uh, I, I think, uh, would you agree with me on that, uh, Dr. Nikhil and Dr. Shila? No, I mean, disappearing, I mean, sorry, shrinking margins, so the liver which is uh, shrunken, you can leave that. So you just have to do a margin resection with the current scan. Correct, Dr. Shila? I think uh, if it shrinks uh, after patient goes to oncologist and if the th tumor shrinks, I am very happy. When I send patient to oncologist, I am not expecting it to shrink. If it shrinks, I am actually happier. Um, I would more be aligned with the FLR and reduction of the post hepatectomy liver insufficiency kind of a, a, you know, a attitude after the oncology. In fact, we have sent some patients to radiology with, and done a Y90 with the intention uh, to actually get uh, bridging. Because I, I, my more worried of progression of disease when the patient visits my oncology for a few months, uh, the more uh, more than 50% chance happens the disease will progress. With the chemo side effects, especially as I told my elderly population are not able to tolerate the full spectrum of the chemo. And once, once the side effects and the toxicity develops, then the dose reduction will come in and various other things will come in and, and the relapse or disease progression is a significant problem to us. So we actually sometimes bridge it with Y90 and then and then bring the patient to resection. So to, to me, at least if there is no progression, I would just uh, be inclined to, to, to do the surgery. If it shrinks, I am very happy already. Thank you. Yeah, but, so can I ask one question here? So once we are discussing about that chemotherapy, induced injury and all. So how much of the liver injury do you expect after three months of chemotherapy? I just want to understand to have that idea. So if we give, say, suppose somebody is potentially convertible where, where you are not confident about getting the good margins or the resection may be a wider one or somebody who is unresectable, you are trying to convert it. So if we give three months of chemotherapy, so how much liver injury do you expect out of it? So that it becomes really terrible for you to go for a resection. Can I take uh, it? 
yeah anyone of you can do yeah, it anyone yeah actually uh, that's uh, we cannot pre- that depends on each patient yeah. like how much injury happens to the liver depends on how the liver was before Very like in our area like uh, i am from south india so we have a lot of nash patients i i have i rarely see patients without a, some degree of fatty liver in our area so mm-hmm. the degree of fatty liver as well uh, decide how much injury is going to happen uh, additionally with this ironotecan and other other things all right so say we, suppose we cannot, if we give uh, polypox or polyphery and there is already grade 1 or 2 fatty liver so uh, do you expect it to turn into cirrhotic at the end of 3 months it will not turn into cirrhosis but definitely this uh, steatohepatitis will worsen so in this situation yeah. like uh, uh, we have discussed before now our oncologists have a different practice here like if you have more fatty livers they reduce the dose of ta- uh, ironotecan or they may all together avoid ironotecan and they may add an biological agent in an appropriate right. way right. that's so, what we are practicing actually yeah absolutely you made that and point. we close, so closely coming, monitor yeah. this liver part with a, a shear wave and other things now very right. closely we monitor right. yeah. so i was coming to that point only so let's not make a generalized statement that instead of doing a chemotherapy we avoid it all together but we have to just individualize and make the modifications accordingly i think that's I'll, the way I'll, to go. give yeah. a certain perspective here so uh, yeah. one thing uh, doc uh, i mean i I'm, i concur with dr shafali rather here so doctor uh, uh, shabir ali you said that i would rather uh, do a major resection or do advanced strategies but see uh, my thought process here is that many of these patients are going to recur right so i would want to do as much parenchyma preservation as possible now in terms of morbidity of uh, like say if we have to balance the chemotoxicity versus a major resection if i feel that by giving chemotherapy i can avoid a major resection like if this tumor is going to get away a little away from uh, mhv and then i can do just a wedge resection rather doing a left hepatectomy i would take that chance uh, obviously we would never have data about this but i would be conservative in the resection because these patients will require future surgery these patients will require future ablation and i would want to go as conservative as possible and i think chemo that is the thing i mean in these patients we have to look at the scans map the lesions and see how much value we can add by which approach and it's it's very 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 subjective uh, i i don't think they so, will ever be able to answer us that uh, so, so i think uh, i think we need to have a balance on this it's not like one side we need to have a balance on this approach either approach so i think uh, so, we have a difference in opinion so dr partho is saying his liver resection margin will be based on the pre chemotherapy scan and dr nikhil and dr shilath is saying that probably you are going to your margin will be based on the post chemotherapy scan based on the sunken volume is that correct or yes. so for the audience yes. what will be the take home message so what margin take home message so this this has been done and dusted the data suggests that uh, the margin uh, from the current scan is fine and now people are talking about sub centimetric margin so i'll take that question later i have a slide on that also right so so now let's go back to the patient which we were talking about so uh, solitary metastasis in segment 8 with sigmoid colon so i guess uh, everybody agrees for an upfront simultaneous resection right yes right yes. so so this patient underwent a lap anterior resection with lap liver metastasectomy and uh, he uh, was fine so uh, uh, like any take on open versus laparoscopic approach dr shabir ali yeah this uh, definitely will go for a laparoscopic approach our practice so which, which are the reasons which you will choose for laparoscopic approach and which are the reasons which you will choose for open approach yeah we are doing at least like uh, 60 70% of liver resections now laparoscopically including major resections so peripheral lesions uh, and in the accessible areas definitely they go for laparoscopic approach those lesions which are in the like in the segment 7 uh, and all no some lesions i may consider upfront for an open but even some of the peripheral lesions in segment 7 we have done laparoscopically so it's like uh, basically each pa- patient dependent we may attempt to see the laparoscopy in any patient like we may see the access and if it is possible to mobilize and uh, get that lesion comfortably with a wa- proper margins we may go for laparoscopy in any lesion 
So I guess uh, what the take home message could be here, yeah, you can choose based on your expertise. Right. So, so we would uh, want to do uh, change the approach. If we want to do a metastatectomy, we would want don't want to change the approach. We would do a parenchyma sparing surgery, but we will uh, take a approach which is more convenient to us. Right. So, uh, so uh, I mean, we discussed new adjuvant. Actually, it was supposed to be discussed here. So I'll just uh, briefly present a case. Uh, which presented with a right-sided lesion and three lesions in the left side of uh, uh, liver. And she was Kerans wild. And uh, these are the scans. Okay, so can you have a look? So this one lesion is sitting on top of left hepatic vein. This middle lesion is uh, aborting the middle hepatic vein and left portal pedicle. And there is one in the caudate. Right, I'll just have it run once more and then I'll just go through. Right, and you can see this one is sitting on uh, top of left and the other is abutting the portal pedicle. So, Dr. Uh, Shalat, this patient you take for upfront or you would want to give, or uh, let me ask you another question first. So, you would want to do a metastatectomy here or you would want to do a uh, hepatectomy? I just saw two lesions on the left portal and the so one in We can one. forget about that. Uh, so there is one sitting on. Uh, let, let me go back to previous slide. So so right side is the MR. So there's one on uh, left hepatic vein, one on the left side of middle hepatic vein, and one in the caudate. Cordate just goes a little fast, so forget about that. Uh, these are the two lesions which will determine our. I, I think this patient uh, doing an upfront liver resection, you probably the margins are not going to be R0. Extremely high risk of a R1 uh, resection. But we can margin. get an R0 resection with left hepatectomy and uh, 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 MHV resection. is possible to do uh, but again that boils down to the patient fitness and performance status and all that if the patient is very young you could probably consider a, a, a liver resection up front but this is something i would i would consider for some form of perioperative i, I think chemo first uh, you know and then then consider restaging after three months and then make a judgment call so that's what we did and this patient underwent a four cycle of uh, Falpox with Vectivix, uh, total five cycles, uh, chemotherapy drop. So one question we would want to ask our panelists for the uh, uh, understanding. Dr. Nikhil, can I interrupt? Yeah. Sorry. So we yeah, have please. Dr. Sandeep Patna and Dr. Viraj also here. They both are doing GI. So you can direct your medical oncology questions to them also. Great. So uh, I think, uh, so <laughs> Dr. Shepali, most of our discussion took place in earlier slides. <laughs> I, I think it will be uh, not fair to uh, go back to that discussion at this point of time. Uh, so uh, uh, this is a surgeon's question here. So how long, you, uh, if you're uh, giving new adjuvant, how long do you want to give it? Uh, both in terms of uh, resectable disease and unresectable disease. So Dr. Shabir Ali. Yeah, this one, uh, we will go for a standard new adjuvant, maybe at least three months. Uh, this is a Keras wild. Yeah. Newton may maybe in this situation we may initially go for a uh, standard chemotherapy and then after three cycles, uh, three months we may reassess this patient. Right. Three months means six cycles or four cycles? No, we'll go for six cycles in this patient definitely. Yeah. Okay. And in unresectable patients, how do you assess? Unresectable again after six cycles on DVC. Okay. Four cycles. Right. And Dr. Partha, you do the same three months or two months? Three cycles. But before that, I have a question. If yeah. we uh, go for a neoadjuvant therapy in this patient, given the location of the lesions, what sort of limited resection are we planning after the neoadjuvant therapy? Because both these okay. lesions, if you see, one is right abutting on the left hepatic vein, other is wedged between the middle and the left. 
I don't think these are lesions which will convert a, our plan into a non-anatomical resection. Both are extremely difficult to be resected. So, so I think I, at the end of the day, we would still go ahead with a left epidectomy to get a good margin. And I think this case, we should reconsider our decision to give neoadjuvant uh, rather than go for a left epidectomy with a cordial resection. Left hepatectomy with uh, middle uh, hepatic vein with cordate. In fact, going for neoadjuvant would give you a worse liver, remnant liver, when you finally end up doing a left hepatectomy rather than going for an upfront. Only in this how case, you, the location is very sequence. difficult. So how would you sequence? So like, uh, fine. So there is this, uh, uh, you would do a left hepatectomy with cordate with MHV. Uh, so how are you going to sequence? So, so you are going to liver first? No, because this is going simultaneous to a, resection. This is this is a fairly okay case for a simultaneous because you want to do a right hemicolectomy, and you're going to do an anatomical liver resection. So major liver resection with okay with because we have to do cordate and MHV also. My point is after fall fox and if we still uh, are going to do a uh, left hepatectomy, I would want my FLR to be a healthy one rather than a, a cash one. Okay, so so means uh, yes. I mean, I there is, agree uh, with the point that uh, th there are situations where most of the time we would consider um, neoadjuvant if it's in a difficult location. But in this case, I think we should revisit our decision to do a neoadjuvant. And I want the balance of opinion. One thing uh, which uh, I would slightly differ from uh, is that we give like generally four cycles of chemo and then reassess. So we like uh, reassess every two months. Uh, that is one thing. So, like, if the response is not significant or if not happy with the progress, you can intervene a little early. And generally, four cycles of chemo doesn't uh, do that harm to liver, especially if we are not using BEV or something. Uh, for Fox four months, four cycles is generally not that bad. And uh, okay, we'll see the uh, response in four cycles. We'll show you the, that MR also. But yes, I mean. Uh, uh, this this something like uh, this is will be a very controversial not controversial but very subjective decision here to go ahead with new adjuvant and then uh, plan for a parenchyma sparing surgery vis a vis uh, doing a left uh, with MHV with cordet because there are no clear cut answers but I think both approaches would be right in their own senses. Dr. Shilat, you want to add something here? No, I think that's a very great discussion with regards to upfront surgery for. Um, uh, for this patient. And I think right hemicolectomy is not a big deal, but the problem is left hepatectomy and the right hemicolectomy. So again, it boils down to the performance status of the patient um, and, and the comfort level of the surgeon. Um, if, if the comfort level is high, then I think uh, is is fairly good to, to go ahead and do. I would also agree with the view that uh, about two months or, you know, few cycles of Folfox wouldn't cause a significant chemo-associated liver injury up to the point that uh, you will develop liver failure. Um, so I think in either way, I agree both the strategies are, but probably if the patient profile is, uh, you know, comorbid and other things, uh, then giving chemo first, getting the colon out, giving chemo, and then uh, redoing the liver after two, three months is fairly reasonable approach as well. Over to you, Nikhil. So, so this, I think, uh, is now settled. And now, uh, what if there is progression? What do you do? Uh, Dr. Partha. So basically, my question is, you go ahead with resection or you label it as poor biology or don't do anything? No, I think I'll, I'll respect the biology and, and withhold the resection. Because this will involve a major liver resection. And so if, if it is still resectable, it has progressed, but it's still resectable. I'm talking, the question is about biology. I think I, I would not resect it. If it's progressing despite new argument, if it's not static, if it's progressing, I would not resect. Shall we really? Yeah, no, no. This uh, Even if it shows mild progression, no. If it is still resectable, you have few options there. It's not resection alone in these situations. Uh, we have other options of ablation and all is coming up very well. If you feel that the patient uh, is uh, slightly progressed and a major resection is a bit uh, 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 risky on a poor biology tumor, you can go for even go for an ablation of these tumors, especially a microwave if you include in those tumors which are wedged between the veins now. 
some form of ablation i would attempt uh, and then continue with systemic maybe primary l resect and then continue with systemic treatment and then see later on whether resection can be done oh, based i on get it so so basically you will attempt to i want yeah, yeah, i want or even a metastatectomy i would attempt it will be a difficult case for that i mean if it is radiologically resectable pet scan doesn't show any extra hepatic disease it's just the increase in the size of the lesions based on the image if that is how we define a progression uh, there is no lymph nodal uh, disease elsewhere um, it's just incremental size say for example uh, then i would still consider uh, treating them rather than uh, the intention would be to aim for cure rather than aim for palliation and comfort um, so i would still uh, use my multi multimodal approach including y90 tase um, ablative strategies and then aim mm -hmm. towards a cure because technically if it is resectable i would prefer to resect rather than um, let the nature disease take its course unless you define progression as uh, you know new lesions in the lung new lymph node spread which is evident these are good cases to do a pet ct or pet mr and, and then make a decision call but I, I i would also know where dr partha is coming from because uh, the disease biology itself is revealing now with the, you know revealing to you that you know regardless of what i am growing uh, and there will be circulating tumor cells so so in these cases even if you resect i would actually be very cautious in family and patient discussions i would not be caught quoting the high end statistical figure of survival of five year of 40 and 10 year of 20 and all that uh, I, I would be you know aware that even if i resect the survival outcomes are a little bit inferior compared to the standard uh, pro projected survival so in that sense the patient expectations has to be measured by appropriate informed consenting I, what to you nikhil yeah uh, dr animesh wants to add something here yeah yeah i think uh, dr shridhar is right both Hepatectomy, uh, hemicolectomy, and quadrant resection these are major surgery, and it might need staged approach. Uh, and by doing that and uh, waiting for recovery for four to six weeks, by the time you have wasted say a two months, two and a half months, and if the biology is not right in that two and a half months, you might see new lesion or progression elsewhere. You don't want that. Uh, to happen to your patient. So maybe we need to uh, make a cautious comment to the family that probably the prognosis is not good in progressing in spite of the new and new approach. Yes, absolutely. Dr. Kefali, there are questions in the chat box. I am not able to take them. So if there are some relevant questions, either answer or you can just take them uh, because I am not able to see. Okay, sure. Okay. So, so and, uh, and and we will just uh, I mean I have a lot many slides but we'll continue for ten more minutes and then we'll continue whatever we can. So uh, so uh, we 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 did uh, shrinking margin disappearing we've discussed and uh, so I think we can just leave it that. So so uh, Doc Partha so this is the scan after uh, these five cycles of chemotherapy. Right, and uh, just let me run them. Fortunately, these lesions uh, shrunk in size significantly. Right, so the left one is a CT scan, and the right one uh, is a MR. And uh, we did get away with the parenchyma. Okay, I will wanted to discuss intraoperative ultrasound here. Uh, so intraoperative ultrasound is something which we should all know about. Anybody who's doing this colorectal river metastasis, I guess this is a, a very, very important uh, part of the armamentarium. Dr. Shilat, what do you uh, want to add here? No, I think uh, I think there's very important skill. Just that there is no formal training curriculum or course uh, to to uh, to learn or acquire that skill. So most of us acquire by practicing and and getting some um, see how our seniors have done and mentors have done. Uh, but I think there is no dispute. There is no second mind that a surgeon doing liver surgery needs to know intraoperative ultrasound. He needs to know how to interpret the portal way, the, the tumor, the, the distance, the measurement, uh, and there is no substitute to it. 
Uh, so I completely agree. Uh, and in uh, especially when we do HCC in cirrhotic livers, uh, we actually have changed our management in significant patients. Even we do MRI, but still we'll detect all these small, small nodules which come as uh, adenocarcinoma. Uh, so in colorectal uh, as well, it's very, very important skill to have. Even when you do laparoscopic, the man maneuvering the laparoscopic ultrasound probe, uh, I think there is no excuse for any liver surgeon not to uh, not to know the skills. So, uh, uh, do you think that this is uh, like uh, in colorectal liver metastasis? Is it important point uh, from the point of view of specifically parenchyma preserving or detecting new lesions? Well, I would say both. Uh, newer lesions now are not so common because of our imaging is uh, very advanced and good quality. Routinely, we will do MRI liver in Tantoxin Hospital routinely. So most of the time, it's not much about detecting new lesions when we talk of colorectal mets, partly because the MR, uh, the image quality is good. But increasingly, there are some patients now with the COVID over the last two years, they have to wait a little bit longer to come to surgical table where the interval between your last scan and the surgical date is almost about six to eight weeks. In that uh, instance, it is very important to, the, to include ultrasound to see the future liver remnant uh, because you really don't want to compromise on the future liver remnant with any uh, missed metastatic uh, deposit. Uh, considering the fact that now after surgery, your patient will have the next scan in only about three months time. Uh, so it's very important. But I think for parenchyma preservation, also it plays a very important role um, in localizing the, the lesion, uh, assessing the distance from your major vessels and the pedicles, uh, seeing the, the few millimeter space and gap between there where you could actually use QSA to, to aim for an R0 resection. Um, so it, it, it is an essential tool, yeah. So one, one thing which I would want to add here, like when we were discussing preoperative workup, so uh, MR was like, you do only selectively, uh, most of the panelists says, but uh, one point which we generally practice is that we do MR in all our patients. Uh, when like uh, there is solitary lesion, then also we do MR because it gives us a good baseline. MR, like so future comparison, they'll get chemo probably, they will have recurrence of lesions. So it gives us a baseline scan. So we'll do scan MR scan on all our patients. And when we reassess them after chemotherapy, we rather uh, do them with MR. So a very frequent MR, less CT scan, lesser PET scan. So that is the frequency of scanning uh, generally what we do. Right. So, Same, Nikhil. Uh, for me, in Tantoxin also, CT, thorax, subdo, pelvis, and MRI liver is routine. The PET scan yeah. is a selective uh, application. MR liver is routine and liberal as exactly what you mentioned. Yeah. Right. 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 So, so uh, this patient underwent uh, this metastatectomy. So we did a parenchyma sparing resection in this. We did three metastatectomy and a right hemicolectomy. Uh, these are the intraoperative uh, photographs. And uh, this is the lesion on the left hepatic vein. Uh, this is the lesion, uh, you can see this middle hepatic vein here and this portal pedicle and this part of the liver on this side got devascularized, so we had to remove it and these are the things, right? So these three lesions and uh, so I think uh, in such kind of resections, we should understand the role of margins and uh, Dr. Shalat already told us about the margins. So uh, uh, sub millimetric margin. That's what you said, Dr. Salat. Now it's final. Sub, sub uh, one millimeter margins. I mean, uh, one millimeter margins are fine. <laughs> well, the data shows it is fine, but I think Shefali also said that most of these data are limited by your power, power of the study, the sample size, because this is not the primary aim of those reports and these are retrospective. So I think the data shows that any amount of margin if you get is okay with chemo and biologics, the patient's survival is better because the comparative is not operating at all. If you use that as a comparator, then of course your R1 resection is fine, but the goal is always to aim for R0. And, and vascular margin, uh, there are papers which does suggest that uh, vascular margin positivity, if you have like uh, separated it from the vessels, then it's okay. What do you think, Dr. Bidali? Yeah, in situations where uh, you can't go for a, a resection beyond, we also would uh, stay on the vein. Like in that, that lesion, we may go on the middle hepatic vein and take it and accept it. 
Yeah. I mean, so like, is it equivalent survival or it will give you a poorer survival? Like, obviously, the data says that it gives you, but what's your thought there? Yeah, I think it it should be equivalent. Mm-hmm. So in that vascular area after chemotherapy, yeah, yes. and maybe it's so a any any data of... on biliary margin anywhere? Like, uh, I've seen some of the lesions which are very close to biliary pedicles, and I've shaved them off in not in terms of like. A tumor, but yes, if they are separable. So, in any idea, uh, Dr. Chala, Dr. Partha, anybody? No, I think collateral liver mass resection uh, will be different from uh, a resection margin for a hepatocellular carcinoma or other cholangiocarcinoma in the sense that here we are equally depending upon adjuvant therapy also for the for the cure. So, uh, here I, I think it, it's acceptable to to. Preserve vessels and and uh, biliary drainage, and uh, trade off is okay if you can uh, avoid a major liver resection. So, so this patient continued chemotherapy, and this is the post uh, uh, chemotherapy scan, and she's is still doing fine. So, uh, I guess uh, let's go back to the first case, and uh, this patient was T three N zero M one, eighty nodes all free. Uh, we discussed the adjuvant, new adjuvant, so I'm not asking that question. This patient did receive uh, uh, adjuvant, and uh, post adjuvant, the scan showed recurrence in the liver. So there were three, four lesions in the liver. Uh, and uh, what would be the next step? Like, uh, did you see the scan? I think I'll run the scan and then ask the next step. Dr. Uh, Shalat, so what would be the next case in uh, step in this patient? So I guess there are three reasons. One, one on the uh, segment eight periphery, one on uh, segment seven periphery, and one somewhere in the deeper center. So this is the first patient with the cecal tumor. Uh, first this patient is... with sigmoid tumor and sigmoid. solitary segment eight metastasis. Post oh, resection, well, post adjuvant. Segment eight, and now this is a this is a follow up at one year, is it? Yeah. All right. I mean, if there are three lesions, if there are two peripheral, one central, there are various choices. We could just go for uh, resection. Uh, the PET scan is not good for surgical planning, so I wouldn't, uh, uh, I wouldn't uh, make any plans based on this image. I would actually review the MR and the CT to see the. So, the so we emotions. have that. This is a representative. I mean, just to. Yes. So I would actually review those carefully. Uh, yeah. But if there are peripheral lesions, uh, I, I would actually go for resection. If one of the lesion is close to the vessels or you know, a bit close to the hilum, etc., we do have capabilities of intraoperative ablation. So you, when the patient is under anesthesia, you are taking out certain peripheral lesions, uh, a deeper lesion. You want to preserve the parenchyma and don't want to do a major right or left liver resection. Then you could actually get ablated, uh, that lesion ablated. Um, over to you, Nikhil. Yeah. So, Sabirali, which lesions will you choose for ablation and which would you resect? Yeah, in this situation, especially with more than one year disease-free, definitely we should treat them. Uh, the peripheral ones, uh, we would go for resection and the deeper one may be close to the middle hepatic vein or venous structures. We may go for an ablation, maybe a microwave ablation. So why not ablate all? Uh, this... Those resectable, better to resect. And especially peripheral lesions, I think they may have a concern for ablation as well. So, so we don't have an intervention radiologist on panel. So I will be the devil's advocate here. <laughs> so, so, so why not uh, ablate? I mean, now we yeah, do I, have I, data. I, can I, can I, 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 I have questions for you here. This is a specific place for you. Uh, let me first sort out ablation and then we'll uh, talk about uh, radiation also. So, so if we have lesions which are like say three lesions which are less than two centimeter, uh, uh, not close to uh, say any bowel, and uh, if they are easily ablatable, and uh, then why pay, subject this patient to surgery? Maybe as surgeons we still believe surgery is better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I do agree with you. But in a poor biology patient, no, if it has happened within just after the chemotherapy in your immediate scan has shown new lesions, definitely I would go for ablation. Yes. Yeah, in a good biology patient, uh, I would refer resection of the maximum possible lesions and then 
maybe those uh, non uh, resectable ones they go for ablation mm -hmm. so your approach same i, I think um, resection is at least our belief is that resection is definitely better than ablation any day because you you are sure about accessing all of the tumor ablation there are so many other variables in, in the picture so uh, you do not know how much of tumor you actually leave behind so if you can do a resection with parenchyma preservation in a good biology that should be the first choice so i i i mean i i would agree with all these statements generally the approach i take there is like if i can do a laparoscopic resection or if i'm going uh, for some surgery like if it's a synchronous resection i'm doing colon at the same time then i prefer to resect but if there is one lesion which is deep or if it requires an open somewhere on the top of segment 8 near cava uh, then and it's a small lesion obviously less than 2 cm uh, then probably i won't mind ablating them uh, but obviously there should be a good candidate for ablation and we'll closely monitor them and if required we can resect them uh, later now obviously uh, there is now a good uh, amount of data which is coming up for uh, sbrt dr animesh we would specifically want to know from you which are the lesions which would be very very uh, or rather suitable for sbrt which are the patients and which are the uh, lesions sbrt or any uh, radiation induced uh, approach so uh, whenever uh, we uh, assess a patient for sbrt uh, see a uh, i uh, i was there in uk for three years between 2017 and 19 so they are their approach is uh, cte which is commissioning to evaluation they had a strict inclusion criteria for the sbrt so there has to be one to three liver lesion and the largest lesion has to be less than 5 cm if there are uh, less lesion i think uh, we can treat slightly larger lesion provided the dose constraint for the organ address and mean liver dose are meeting so there has to be one to three lesion and larger liver lesion less than 5 cm uh liver functions are within normal range child for a it got a life expectancy of more than 6 months and it got a, a disease free survival whenever treating is a metachronous patient they got a disease free survival of more than 6 months okay patient does not have any active hepatitis or hepatic failure it doesn't have any a large volume extra hepatic metastasis these are the patient will consider for uh, liver uh, liver sbrt so uh, the exclusion criteria i think extensive extra hepatic pet uh, multiple liver lesion uh, active hepatitis or hepatic uh, liver failure uh, deranged liver function child pap b or c liver uh, Uh, I mean, if in terms of HCT, but uh, so uh, these are the criteria which will uh, exclude help me to exclude patient for liver SBRT. So, uh, in terms of number of lesion and size of lesion, if uh, there is also slightly larger lesion or three or more lesion, we usually look at our uh, dosimetry. We look at the dose constraint that we can achieve for the liver. We got strict criteria. if we can meet the uh, dose constraint uh, to the organ address and the mean dose to the liver and other constraint that we use in our addition of we will treat those patients uh, in terms of outcome uh, the reported literature shows that two year local control between 70 to 80 percent two year local control uh, we'll, i'll not comment about the overall survival because this is confounded by the systemic therapy patient receives afterward So two year local control between 70 to 80 percent uh regarding the comparison with other ablative approach like rfa or microwave or tear or tape so there are conflicting data there are some data uh, when uh, mostly the data are as retrospective or phase 2 data there is hardly any level 1 evidence comparing saver versus tape versus microwave or rfa whatever data we have either retrospective or phase two so uh, for smaller lesion less than 2 cm uh, rfa and saber are equally effective for larger lesion more than 2 cm saber would be better in terms of local control over rfa uh, there are limited data uh, 
for saver versus taste or hair most data suggest that it could the uh, equivalent outcome so i i, I guess i'll just we have to conclude in next uh, dr nikhil and... there are some good questions in the chat box if you wish to take so, so uh, uh, dr shefali 5 minutes we conclude this and then we'll take questions okay uh, i okay, think okay, it's fair, high time fair. Fair. so right. i'll just uh, uh, we i'll just show this what happened to this patient so one of the lesions progressed uh, despite rfa uh, two three sessions of rfa and this lesion progressed right so uh, this patient was put on uh, like uh, more chemotherapy so he got falfirinox plus bev i think and uh, we already uh, discussed strategy for parenchyma uh, enhancement so we'll not get into that and despite progression we resected this so he underwent a modified uh, extended left hepatectomy and uh, uh, this is the tumor uh, this is the lesion and uh, uh, so this was around 3 years ago and fortunately this patient has still not uh, recovered uh, despite progressing on chemo and despite being such a bad disease looking at overall but uh, fortunately so so this just uh, to put this across that you can always hope for something in colorectal liver metastasis uh, biology proportional i mean yes uh, but then it it sometimes works so any role of third line uh, chemotherapy second line chemotherapy after failure of two lines of chemotherapy after resecting these patients uh, dr shepali you can bring in dr batra here or uh, dr batra i think has left i think viraj can answer and he has a pertinent question here also viraj can you pitch in yeah so uh, after this uh, liver hepatectomy uh, and assuming this was a progression after liver directed therapy uh i would not give any further chemotherapy because patient already received fofox uh, earlier two years ago and i guess for phenox uh, before this approach so i would just uh, hope and pray it's a very lucky patient that even after progressing on rfa uh, this patient is 3 years out uh the question i had was anybody doing hai in this because these are ideal candidates for hepatic artery infusion where the disease keeps coming back in the liver and liver alone anybody pump available in india dr viraj i so i think so the metronic pump which they use for epidural i think so the sloan guys are using that uh, so, so any I think experience with you after this dr viraj i think oh, i am looking uh, to it actively uh, looking at it dr silak uh, or anybody else using this no we are not um, into hai at least um, in singapore and also in my hospital but, but data is very encouraging i mean hai data is something which uh, very encouraging i always get uh, uh, excited by the data but obviously uh, i i tried to look into the pump it was not available in our country but viraj has some suggestions and i'll connect with him later and uh, we will definitely start this uh, so any any role of ct dna so if ct dna is positive after resection uh, there is a 100% chance of recurrence so i presume if you would have done ct dna after this resection it would have come negative <laughs> so uh, would you like base any third line based on ct dna or uh, second line or third line if it was like uh, first line if recurred after first line and then you would resect uh, uh, no not really we don't use ct dna for that uh, as of today right so this was three year post three year scan done recently and it's fine and i think uh, we'll just discuss one rectal case because that's a very very different that brings totally different nuances to the approach and uh, uh, so a 46 year old gentleman presented to us with a middle rectal growth and a solitary liver metastasis right so dr shalak what will your approach be sorry where, where is the liver lesion the liver lesion in segment uh, 4b 4b5 oh okay and the rectum is symptom it's, symptomatic uh, not uh, not symptomatic and if we in terms of good bad and ugly we can say uh, uh, bad not ugly but bad so few lymph nodes crm3 i will i will discuss with my colorectal team and if their confident level is high um you know it's not like a very low rectal lesion etc it's just a standard uh, anti resection kind and very not a very low anti resection i would go for synchronous 
so I, I guess doxilla if you don't do rectals uh, so this patient will require uh, radiation yeah so if it is low rectal uh, tumor i didn't know where is the rectal lesion so if this is low rectal and the if plan is upfront chemo radiation first then patient should go for for either short course or long course chemo uh, radiation and, and then the decision would be to restage and then make a judgment call uh, but this this patient basically liver can be removed at any point of time in the journey right uh, depending on when the rectal guys uh, are, are you know going in. So I guess Shani, do you Dr. mean rectal? Can I pitch in? Uh, yes. So basically, you are dealing with a primary rectal cancer with metastasis. Both are resectable, but there are yes. high risk features in the primary. But PRM not yes. Yes. So in yes. that yes. case, uh, our approach should be a short course pelvic RT. We don't want to delay the uh, surgery or systemic treatment. Short course pelvic RT without delay, we can proceed with the surgery to primary and meds, and then adjuvant chemotherapy after surgery. That should be our approach, and that we follow now. Right. Yeah. Dr. Shabir, you're mute. Dr. Shabir, you're mute. Yeah, sorry. In this situation, our approach is basically the indication for RT has to be seen. Whether you need a real debulking or you just need to give RT for uh, exactly. just just for the sake of lymph nodes. So, so what, you, what would you do if it's required debulking and what would you do if it requires debulking, it's... what we have done is I have managed one patient like that. What I did is in that patient, our uh, board decision was to go for a neoadjuvant because in rectum, more and more now, neoadjuvant is coming up. Chemo is coming up, neoadjuvant. So they have given uh, four cycles of chemo first. And after that, they have given me the patient for doing the liver first. And then we have go for, gone for a de definitive chemo RT and then did the rectum. Why not and synchronous? It, uh, that was because uh, you have to go for a definitive chemo RT and then there will be a, a too much delay for treating the liver disease. No, that's what we felt. Mm -hmm. And I did a lab resection and there was only a 10 days gap for that new urge. Partha? That's a peripheral lesion. This patient, we would uh, we would give a new urge uh, CTRT followed by a, we can do a synchronous uh, rectal. Which, which CTRT? Long course, short course? Long course. So, I mean, don't, aren't you worried about disease progression when you give long course? Because, see, there, there's a solitary liver met and um, we are anyway getting systemic control with uh, CTRT. Uh, yes, I mean, but generally the dose of uh, chemo which we give for long course is very, very less. So generally, like, we would refrain from giving these patients long course RT. So, I mean, in this patient, the approach we take... debulking, uh, we would definitely go for a short course. And so, no, Shabirali, even if it requires significant downstaging, so what you're talking about is CRM threatened tumors, which we call it bad tumors. You can give short course and then you give Yeah, then you can chemo. continue chemo. That is a second option, yeah. Right. Definitely or you, you can give some delay. chemo. Yeah. yeah, you can give some chemo, then short course, then some more chemo, depending on what kind of surgical resection on liver you are planning. So like for this patient, we gave four cycles of chemo. We gave short course RT and immediate surgery after RT, that one week later. So, so that was the plan which we did. And if this patient would have, say, for an example, required downstaging of rectal cancer. So, so uh, at that time, so uh, like some downstaging happened with chemo. So like it was good enough for a short course radiation and immediate surgery. If it would have required further downstaging, I would have just done the liver and left the rectal for four more cycles or eight more cycles and then would have done it. Like generally four more cycles and then would have done it. This we did a synchronous resection after this. So we uh, gave four cycles of Falfox, short course RT, and then synchronous resection. And, and this lesion was uh, uh, not visible without an intraoperative ultrasound. Right, so MR barely showed the lesion and intra, uh, that was after four cycles and uh, intraoperative ultrasound was needed to localize this lesion. And uh, I, I, I guess uh, that, uh, I think we should conclude with this. Dr. Shepali will just take a couple of questions and then we'll conclude this. Yeah, sure. So, uh, just I'll be seeing that uh, which are still unanswered. So, uh, okay, hip, uh, HAI we have discussed. Now, role of chemo we have discussed. Uh, okay. 
and so somebody asked uh, to just highlight the role of taste or tear if there is any uh, in this situation so any of any one of you can take this question till i screen others not much role in, because uh, these are not very uh, artery enhancing lesions i don't think taste or tear has much role in in colorectal liver meds yes so maybe dr shafan is there is yeah dr shafan is telling something sorry well we we do sometimes in uh, borderline resectable or the non resectable patients so we will uh, to give them uh, to reduce the the systemic side effects from the from the chemo especially in elderly patients more than 80 85 with multiple comorbid conditions they are not really suitable for systemic therapy uh, i think rather than doing nothing to them uh, we will actually give y90 dose um, or a gentle taste uh, to just uh, have some disease control while they carry on with their normal uh, normal life um, Uh, we have seen anecdotal patients getting Y90 and the tumor shrinks uh, and the tumor responds and patients even live up to three to four years. Uh, so I would say there is role in selective patients, uh, selective situations. There is definitely role of both uh, conventional taste as well as DAP taste, uh, drug eluting B taste as well as Y90. The problem with Y90 is when we did. few years back the first patient with the y90 and then went to liver resection almost like a conversion uh, patient uh, <laughs> we didn't have a protocol on specimen handling and the pathology department freaked out that we are giving radiation uh, in our department uh, and we had to then come out with a protocol of how to manage the specimen and and pathology department need to be told up front the day before that the radiation liver is going to come uh, because they might have pregnant staff and all that so that was a, a like a hospital event it was it was raised to the quality team um, a few years back yeah so we have we are doing y90 very frequently mostly for hcc of course uh, but i think selected patients we are still doing for colorectal sure and uh, there is one more question so if both surgery and rfa are feasible for liver so uh, which would you choose and why we we discussed that dr shafali uh okay, i was reading one comment from uh, uh, viraj regarding uh, transplant in that patient less than one year dvfi and uh, transplant so i would rather say transplant is not to be done in this setting no it was not transplant it was it not transplant mean, actually what it is was it? role of okay. chemo i think it was chemo okay i i think i'm reading something so, else so sorry yeah that. so i think uh, uh, that's done for the day So, Dr. Nikhil, we can conclude. That, yeah, I think. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, panelists. Uh, thank you uh, very much for. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shalat, for putting up such a nice uh, presentation, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, bringing in so much expertise. Uh, colorectal liver metastasis management is very challenging, and uh, uh, there are always very, very different views in terms of like surgical views. We saw there are so much difference. and when you put medical oncologist and radiation oncologist on table the views just go <laughs> bonkers dr shafali has to sometimes suffer me for <laughs> these different no, views no. but no but, i should but, thank but, viraj for my rescue today no <laughs> right all right and uh, so so it, it's definitely challenging and uh, this is very very interesting and uh, thank you everyone for bringing so much expertise and i'm also sorry for Uh, uh keeping you away from your dinner table and your family for so long uh i think i i can't be thankful of any more and uh, thank you very much i think we should just yeah, conclude so you. good night thank and you. thank you good night yeah good night bye yeah bye good night bye 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 bye, bye. 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 bye.